Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy we have in your presence. Thank you because every time we come together like this, we know by faith, we know because of your faithfulness, that the Lord Jesus Christ is always with us. And we're asking, O Lord, today that your word will comfort us again in your love and mercy and grace in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that this word will find a good place in the soil of every heart, so that, Lord, it will yield the fruit that we expect it to yield in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Bless us in the hearing of your word and in responding to your word that all the benefits and the promises you've given your word will be ours in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Mark chapter 2. And we're reading some verses there. In Mark chapter 2, reading from verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. This man had been brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus knowing the need. And Jesus knowing the relationship between this man and the Heavenly Father. And if the man was not forgiven, the Lord knew what would be the present consequence and what would be the eternal consequence. Therefore he said, after seeing their faith, Son, you have a problem. And the problem is not just the sickness you have. It's a problem of the condemnation and the damnation that is upon you. And therefore he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And then as we look at verse 9, whether is it is here, to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. It says to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go, to the, go thy way to thine house. And immediately he arose, and he took up his bed, and he went forth before them all, in as much as they were all amazed. And he glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And you will see what Jesus did here. I also see the reason why he did what he did. After he had pronounced the sins of the man forgiven. And the Pharisees there were wondering, how could he say that? And the scribes were reasoning among themselves, who could pardon sin but God? Then he said, I'm going to do something. And I'm going to heal him. And this is to give you an evidence to prove that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Obviously, many of the people in that place did not get the understanding why Jesus did what he did. Because after the healing, they were just amazed by the healing. And they glorified God and they said, We never saw it on this fashion. My brothers and sisters, friends, who are here today. That's not the ultimate purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ healing the man. The reason he healed him is that ye may know in verse 10 that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. That's the reason he healed him. Therefore he said to the sick of the policy, Arise, take up thy bed, go thy way into thine house. We're talking today about this important attribute of God and the attribute of Christ and the need of man. Christ's power to forgive and set free from sin. Christ's power to forgive and to set free from sin. Man needs forgiveness from an offended God. Without forgiveness we shall be under condemnation. Under divine wrath and under eternal separation, eternal punishment, judgment for our sins. Our crime, our offense, our sin against God cannot be forgiven by an ordinary man, no matter who that man is. It's just like when you offend the nation. An ordinary man on the street cannot say, I forgive you. 
you have done something wrong against the laws of the land. And then in neighbor, thinking that he's doing good, he says, come on here. I pronounce forgiveness for you. You cannot do that. Nobody ever does that. Even if you said it, it will not hold any water. It will not have any value. You do not have a right to forgive the crimes of people against the nation. And the crimes of people, the offense of people, the sins of people against God, no man has the right to say, I forgive. But Christ has been appointed by God. So that he will be able to give forgiveness. Not only give forgiveness, he also gives freedom from sin. In John chapter 8. Verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You'll know the truth about God's judgment, about God's appointment, about God's decision. He has appointed a man, the man Christ, who died for sins. When you know the truth, that Christ is the appointed one. You know the truth, he makes you free from sin. They answered in verse 33, they answered him. We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How seest thou that ye shall be free? Jesus answered them, Verily I say unto you, Verily, verily I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin. Whosoever committed sin is a weak fellow. And because of his weakness, is in subjection to something above him, outside him, stronger than him. He is yielding to a power that is higher and greater and stronger than himself. Therefore, he is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever. In the house of God, that eternal house, habitation of God, heaven, the sinner who has not been forgiven, who has not been set free, who is still subject and submissive and yielding to sin, cannot abide in the house of the Lord forever. It's not talking of any house here. There is no house here on earth where anybody abides forever. Whether a saint or a sinner, a believer, an unbeliever, there is no house on earth where anybody abides forever. Talking about heaven. The servant of sin. The servant of Satan. The one that is so weak, he doesn't have a power beyond himself to set him free from sin. The servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. It tells us there's a possibility of forgiveness, not only that, there is the possibility of freedom, freedom from sin. Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, it tells us verses 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The power of the Lord Jesus Christ is so great, is so strong, is so mighty. We're forgiven. And then we're set free. And it is the law of the spirit of life in Christ that comes into our lives, does a miraculous work, a regenerating work, and then it sets us free. And we're free from the law of sin and of death. That's why it's important for you to pay attention today as we look at this subject of scripture, the power of Christ, Christ's power to forgive and to set free from sin. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, Christ's power to forgive all sins. Not some, not many, all. Christ's power to forgive all sins. Number two, the Christian's privilege of freedom from all sins. What a great privilege that is. The Christian's privilege of freedom from all sins. Number three, Christ's precept of forgiveness for saved souls. After we are saved, he also gives us the command of precept. 
and instruction. The pattern of life is to be the forgiveness of sins, of offenses that are done against us. Christ's precept of forgiveness for saved souls. I come to number one. It's, we're talking about Christ's power now to forgive all sins. What joy we have that as we come to the Lord, that the Lord Jesus has the power, the power to forgive and the power to quicken whom he will. That is, as we come to the Lord, confessing our sins and turning away from them, depending, relying on the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And we come to him asking for his mercy and compassion and love and grace. He forgives us freely. In Mark chapter 2 again, verse 10. Mark chapter 2, verse 10. For that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I want you to start the sentence from the word know. Know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Know this for a certainty that whatever sins you have committed, whatever offenses against God, against heaven, against your fellow men, against your family, whatever sins you have committed that normally should bring the condemnation, the judgment, the damnation that is eternal upon you, know that Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, has power while you are still here on earth. He has power on earth to forgive sins. Would you please notice the words on earth. After somebody has died, no change, no forgiveness beyond the grave. If there is going to be forgiveness offered to any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, any child, any human being here, it's here on earth. After the fellow has died and is gone to the great beyond, anybody here doing some religious things, and they're saying, I'm going to pay this money to the church, I'm going to do this work so that my friend who has died, he wasn't saved when he was here, he didn't get uh, forgiveness when he was here, but now we're going to do something so that he'll have forgiveness after he's gone. It's too late. No, no forgiveness beyond the grave. Know this, that the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Redeemer, the Savior, He has power on earth to forgive sins. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. In verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom He slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted with his right hand to be a priest and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that has been appointed to give forgiveness of sins. And therefore we go to him and we ask him and we plead with him. And we appreciate and we believe the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross of Calvary. On the basis of that sacrifice, the shedding of his blood, our sins are forgiven. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, and see quicken together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. It's talking actually to the Gentiles here. As I read to you in Acts chapter 5, verse 30, verse 31, because the Father has appointed him, and he has made him to be the Prince and the Savior, to give forgiveness, repentance of forgiveness to Israel. And you might begin to wonder, that's for Israel. How about us here? How about the Gentiles? Can the Gentiles have forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ and you, in verse 13, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh? 
That's the description of the Gentiles. Because talking to the Jews, talking to Israel, he couldn't have said the circumcision of your flesh. He could say on circumcision of your heart to Israel, but not of their flesh. Here he was referring to the Gentiles. And he has quickened you together with him, having forgiven all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That is, the condemnation we had, the judgment we had, the damnation we had, is nailed everything to his cross. Because we believe on the Lord. As we talk about forgiveness, we need to have a proper understanding. Because on this fact, hinges your eternal destiny. Where we spend eternity will depend on whether we have had an understanding. As well as the experience of forgiveness from the Lord. For proper understanding, therefore, this forgiveness, I give you this, number one, the condition of forgiveness. Two, the concept of forgiveness. Three, the completeness of forgiveness. Number four, the cost of that forgiveness. Number five, conversion with forgiveness. That is, conversion goes along with forgiveness. Number six, consecration after forgiveness. Number seven, the consequence of forgiveness. As we look at the scriptures, and we're talking about Christ's power to forgive all sins, and we're talking about the possibility and the reality of you and I having forgiveness from the Lord. Number one, the condition of of forgiveness in Proverbs chapter chapter 28 Proverbs chapter 28 reading from verse 13 he that covereth his sins shall not prosper but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy you hear that God is forgiving people and say let me go to him and then you come to the Lord and you cover it up and you pretend as if nothing ever went wrong. And you have a broad smile on your face. Say, God, here am I. They say you are distributing grace and mercy and love and compassion and forgiveness. I come from my own. And you do not repent. The condition of forgiveness. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Isaiah chapter 55. In Isaiah chapter 55, looking at verse 6, Seek ye the Lord, while he may be found. Call ye upon him, while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. You see that condition right there, you seek the Lord. And the wickedness in your hand, even the thoughts of sin, and the plan of sin, and all the things you've been doing that are not right, you turn away from them. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man his thoughts. Then let him return to the Lord, and God will have mercy upon him. First John chapter 1, First John chapter 1, verse 9. First John chapter 1, Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is just, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The condition, confess, forsake, turn away from them, forgiveness will come. Number two, the concept of forgiveness. When the Lord forgives, what do you understand by that forgiveness? The concept of forgiveness. The kind of forgiveness we receive from the Lord Isaiah chapter 43. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. The understanding of God's forgiveness is that when He forgives, He forgets. He doesn't bring it to His remembrance anymore. 
And it will not be right after you have been saved. After you have been forgiven. To go back to God saying, oh God, I'm a terrible sinner. I'm a wretched man. Yes, I know I've been forgiven. But I still feel miserable. I still feel so dirty. I was so bad when I was uh, in the world. Why are you saying that? Because he says he will not even remember anymore and will not remember thy sins. That's the concept of God's forgiveness in Romans chapter 3 verse 25. Romans chapter 3. Reading from verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission. That's the forgiveness. That's the cleansing. That's the removal. That's the washing away. For the remission, the washing away of sins that are past. Brothers and sisters, the concept of God's forgiveness. He forgives past sins. And you know there are deceivers that you almost give, that you give a license to people to go and do whatever you like. Because they'll say, your sins are all forgiven. Past present and future. Don't worry about it anymore. Once you receive the Lord as your personal Savior, they tell them, all your sins, past, present, future, they are all forgiven. And you say, after being born again, what if I sin? What if I do evil? Oh, they say, don't worry about that. Because all your sins, whenever it will be, wherever it will be, and whatever it will be, all gone. So, you have a license, you are eternally secured. Eternal security. Do whatever you like, do whatever you please, drink whatever you want, smoke whatever you want to smoke. You are forgiven. Past, present, future. Uh uh-uh. uh. That's not the concept of forgiveness in the Word of God. Look at this for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. It is the past sin. That God forgives and then He gives you the grace to go and sin no more. In Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's the concept of God's forgiveness. Number 3. The completeness of God's forgiveness. When He forgives, He forgives. And He forgives everything. All, all, all sins of the past. And you see, there are some people that will feel, I know God has forgiven some of my sins. But uh, I'm still feeling guilty about some others. Why? Because you do not understand. One, the condition. Two, the concept. Number three, the completeness of the forgiveness of God. In Psalm 103, verse 3. Psalm 103, verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities and healeth all thy diseases. That's what he forgives. That's how he forgives. He forgiveth all thine iniquities. The completeness of the forgiveness. Ezekiel chapter 18. In Ezekiel chapter 18, reading from verse 21. Ezekiel 18 verse 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins. And you bundle everything together. And you put everything together. You bring them before the Lord. Merciful God, loving God, a pardoning God. Who is a pardoning God like this? Is grace rich and free. You turn from all your sins. Then it says, if the wicked shall turn from all his sins that he has committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. All of them. The completeness of God's forgiveness. And then it says, in his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? 
How is it that God will just forgive us like that? Well, it's not just forgiving us like that. Somebody paid the price. That's a cost. Number four, the cost of forgiveness. Somebody paid the price for salvation, for the removal of our sins, for the forgiveness of all our sins. The cost has been paid. The price has been paid in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Matthew 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission, removal, forgiveness, pardon of sins. You see, it's the blood of Jesus. And while he remained alive, his blood could not actually be efficacious for the sins of the whole world. But as the lamb was slain, and then after the lamp was slain, the blood was shed. And then we have faith in the shed blood, the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the cause. The cause for our pardon. In Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And almost all things are by the Lord purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus, we could not have been forgiven. And it is the blood of Jesus that grants us the forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And that's why we need to be so grateful to the Lord for what the Lord has done. Because He's taken our sins away. He has forgiven us because of the cost that it cost Him. Because of the price and because of the blood that He shed. And you understand that after we are forgiven, that forgiveness goes along with conversion. It's not just, okay, you are forgiven now, but... You don't, you are not converted yet. There's nothing like that. One side of the coin is forgiveness. The other side of the coin is still the same coin. And it is called salvation. It is called redemption. It is called reconciliation with God, having favor with God. One side of the coin is forgiveness. The other side of the coin is conversion. In Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, there is forgiveness, yes, for the Lord, and then conversion. And they go together. That because the man has been forgiven, the power of the Lord comes into that person's life and there's regeneration. There is conversion. There is salvation. There is the grace of God that has appeared unto all men, teaching us that we deny ungodliness and worldly laws. And now we live soberly, righteously, unblameably in this present world. Number six, consecration after forgiveness. Consecration after forgiveness. After your sins are gone. After your sins are taken away. And you don't, you know, you are not at liberty to say, now I can breathe fresh air. Now I can go out and just be free by myself and do whatever I want to do because the condemnation is gone, the guilt is gone, the yoke is broken. They have released me from the cage. The Almighty God Himself has said, all the sins I committed in the past will not be remembered anymore. I am forgiven. Let me rejoice and celebrate. And then you forget yourself and do whatever you like. It doesn't work like that. The forgiveness of God comes into our lives and it makes us to consecrate our lives to the Lord. Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, reading from verse 2. Wash me truly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Verse 7. Purge me with his soap, And I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. 
that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. So I was asking for forgiveness, creating me a clean heart. So God, renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, I'm going to commit my life to something. Then, after I am forgiven, my sins are taken away. Lord, I'm going to be so grateful, and I'm going to show my gratitude. How? Verse 13, then will I teach, transgress us thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. I'm going to commit my life and consecrate my life to the repentance and the conversion of sinners. There's one thing I'm going to be doing now for the rest of my life. I'm so grateful my sins are forgiven. I'm so grateful I'm on my way to heaven that I'm going to consecrate, commit myself to helping other people to know about this forgiveness. You understand? This is what God does in our lives. And you become so grateful and you want to... Uh, broadcast it and publish it and proclaim it and preach it all around God forgives I can tell you that he's done it for me and if you come to him he will do it for you too that's the lifestyle and that is the major work and the service and ministry of a person who has received forgiveness from the Lord number seven is the consequence of forgiveness number seven the consequence of that forgiveness Psalm 130 Psalm 130, reading from verse 4. Psalm 130, verse 4. But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. That's the consequence. Forgive, the forgiveness of God does not make us to belittle God, look down God, and say, God, after all, you will forgive. I can do whatever I want. God is merciful. Christ died for me on the cross of Calvary. And God has no choice. I'm not afraid of God. I can do whatever I want anytime. And he, he cannot break his promise. He has said if I come to him, he will forgive. I hope he dare not say I cannot forgive you. And therefore let me enjoy myself for a moment now. Uh, God, I am coming. I'm coming. Forgive me now. I'm sorry about that thing. Just forgive me. Can you forgive me now? Ah, uh -huh. no. The consequence of forgiveness. There is forgiveness with thee. That thou mightest be feared. We fear God. We honor God. We respect God. We exalt God. And we yield to God. And we surrender to God. Because of his forgiveness. His forgiveness leads us to a life of Fearing God. And what's the fear of God? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it is to depart from evil. When God has forgiven you, the consequence is that the fear of God will be in your life. And that fear of God will make you to shun evil. And you will abstain from every appearance of evil. I did that before. And that was an offense to God. I did that before, and God was not pleased with that. I did that before when I was a sinner. And God's heart of love was broken and bruised because of me. Now, in His mercy and love, in His goodness and compassion, He has forgiven me. I dare not do that again. I cannot go that way again. Because there is a consequence of the forgiveness that the Lord has given us. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mightest be feared. Number one, the condition of forgiveness. You turn away from the sin, God will forgive. Number two, the concept of forgiveness. He forgives all, all the past sins. Number three, the completeness of forgiveness. Everything will not be remembered anymore. And then number four is the cost of that forgiveness. It took Jesus Christ to go to the cross of Calvary. And to die for you and to die for me. So that we can have that forgiveness. Number five is conversion with forgiveness. Number six, consecration after forgiveness. Number seven, the consequence of forgiveness. I come to point number two. The Christian's privilege of freedom from all sins. The Christian's privilege of freedom from all sins. 
when we come to the Lord, He has the grace and He has the power. Not only to forgive, but to give us the power, the ability to go and live a life that is free from the yoke and the bondage of past sins in our lives. In John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 11 and verse 12. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Here we find the Lord Jesus releasing the woman from her sin and from the bondage and the power of that sin. You mean a sinner? He was telling the woman in a way, and you've been helpless, and you couldn't avoid committing that sin until these Pharisees caught you in the very act of immorality. And now they brought you here. Uh, you know what judgment shall have been upon you. But God is merciful and compassionate and loving. And because of that, this is not the day of judgment. Neither do I condemn you. Go. What do I go to do? Do I go to that same, same partner? Go. What do I go to do? Do I go to that same hotel and keep on messing up? Go. Uh, what do you mean? Go. Do I go to that same spot because I've been living my life getting money from men and that's how I live? Go. But go and sin no more. When you become born again, the privilege of a child of God is that the grace of God and the power of God will come into your life. And the things you used to do, you will not be able to do them anymore because something happened to you. There is a transforming power, a transforming grace that comes into our lives when we're truly born again. The people that, they always come in every Sunday, and they always come in every week, and they say, God, I have sinned again. Forgive me. They are under conviction. There is no conversion. Conviction, but no conversion. When there is conversion, the grace of the Lord will come into our lives, and the voice of the Lord will keep on ringing. Neither do I condemn you for what you have done in the past, in the present, and in the future. Go and sin no more. What God deals with is your past. He deals with your past by His mercy, by His love. And then the present, he deals with your present by his grace, by giving you the power to go and live a transformed life. Unless anybody should have thought that that's only for that woman. He said in verse 12, in verse 12, then speak Jesus against unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Anyone following the Lord, anyone saying, I've met the Lord, I've seen the Lord. I asked him for forgiveness, and he has forgiven me. He's turned my life around. Uh -huh. The evidence of that is that he's the light of the world. And because he's the light of the world, following him means you will not walk in darkness. Verse 30. In verse 30, as he speak these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, ye shall be my disciples indeed. Your word, if ye continue in my word, what word is that? Go and sin no more. That's my word. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's my word. And now, I give you forgiveness. So believe on me. If you continue in my word, in the word that says, go and sin no more, ye shall be my disciples indeed. What's your word? My word is this. He that followeth me will not walk in darkness. There will be no shady deal. There will be no fraudulent deal. There will be nothing we're doing under the cover of the night. There will be nothing. We don't want anybody to see in the daylight that we're doing it under the cover of darkness. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? If you keep on walking in the light, because that's my, that's my word. Walk in the light. Live in the light. Live your life so that everybody will see you are not a child of light. Then in verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He actually said, so free. Verse 36. If the Son, therefore, 
shall make you free. Ye shall be free indeed. If the Son shall make you free, you'll be hundred percent free. You'll be totally free. When you come to the Son of God, when His power, His grace, His blood touches and cleanses your life, it makes you free. Indeed, in chapter 5, verse 14. John chapter 5, verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. Friend, you cannot take the grace of God for granted. Uh, you cannot say, hey, what a merciful Lord this Jesus is. I'm a sick for all these years. And uh, when I came to him, he didn't even mention my sin. All he did was that, uh, would you be made whole? And I said, I don't have anybody to cast me into the river. When the angel comes to trouble the water. And then he said, Arise, take up your bed and walk. And oh, I'm telling you, I just felt the power of God surging through my body. And I rose up and I've never been the same ever since. And now, he didn't even talk about my sin. He didn't even talk about, about uh, whether I should live a different life, I should live a changed life, a transformed life. He just forgave me free of charge. And there is no condition attached to my forgiveness. No condition attached to my healing, to my miracle. Uh, dear friends, brothers and sisters, boys and girls here today, you know, even if it is not mentioned in a particular message, it doesn't mean that it's not important. When Jesus met that man and he said, take up that bed, rise up and walk, the man just went away. And Jesus did not say anything about sin, about righteousness, about holiness. So the man could have been thinking like many people think today in our church. They don't mention about that. When I was born again, and the evangelist preached the word, all he said is that God is love, and God is merciful, God is compassionate. If you want the love of God to reach you, raise up your hand. And I raised up my hand, and I knew that God forgave me, and they didn't mention anything about freedom from sin. And since they didn't mention that, then you come to them, you say, well, in the place I was born again, I was born again at a deeper life retreat. And they said, you confess your sins, and you turn away from your sin, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He will cleanse you from your sin. And after you are forgiven, you live a new life. And uh, then the other fellow says, well, that, that's your own. That's where you were converted. Where you were converted, it was serious against sin. Where I was converted, they never mentioned anything about sin. It doesn't matter whether they mentioned it or they didn't mention it. At the point where this man met Jesus Christ, at that point, it was not mentioned. And now Jesus found him in the temple. And he said, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse sin come unto thee. It's a privilege of a child of God not to continue in sin. Freedom from all sins. It tells us in Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us. When the grace of God comes into our lives, uh, grace is not for fun. Grace is not cheap. The grace of God demands teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. My brothers and sisters, forgiveness is never treated in isolation, in the Word of God. And what I mean is this, and there are some people that, you know, you, you teach forgiveness on a particular day. And they say, praise the Lord, you know, I, I like the subject of today. The subject of today was forgiveness. I like it too. I appreciate it too. And we need to even love God more because He's such a pardoning God. He's such a gracious God. It's just a loving God. And then we get to the house fellowship. And uh, we say, you know, church today was great. Because in the church today, they talked about forgiveness. And then you begin to live carelessly and talk carelessly because you are thinking any day they talk about forgiveness, it is a license, it's a freedom, it's a release 
from righteousness. When they talk about forgiveness, it means now God is love and God is a forgiving God. Go and do as you please. My brother is not like that. My sister is not like that. When the Spirit of God teaches us about forgiveness, it joins with it the privilege to be free from all sins. That's why it says the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. The believer's privilege of freedom from sin. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And that's the purpose and that's the privilege, that now we do not keep on serving sins anymore. As if the sin is so strong, as if the sin is greater than the blood of Jesus, than the power in the blood of the Lamb. We should not have sin in verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Is comparing the man that has now been forgiven with a man that is dead to the world and dead to sin. And that when a person is dead, really dead, the things that used to affect you before, they don't affect you any, they don't affect him anymore. A, a man had been a terrible smoker, now he's dead. All the secrets in the world will not attract his attention, he's gone. A man has been a terrible drunkard before, now he's dead. And all the alcohol in the world will not attract his attention. A man has been a womanizer before, he's you know, just running after women, he has a woman at home, has another woman somewhere else. And no matter how many women is keeping in bondage and committing sin with them, he's still running after some other ones, after some other ones. But now he's, he's dead. After he's dead, all the women in the world will not be a temptation to him to make him to rise up from the grave and jump up out of the coffin and say, Anytime I see those ladies, I don't know, it turns my heart, it turns my mind, it turns my head, it turns everything. And although I was dead, I, I couldn't just resist it. As I came back now, when I finish, I'll go back and die again. You don't do that. When you are dead, you are dead. That's why it says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. In verse 8, Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that you also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died once unto sin. He died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For sin shall not, shall, for let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. That ye should obey it in the loss thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. All the Lord is telling us is that when we are forgiven. He also grants us the grace to live in newness of life. In verse 18 of that same chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 18 being then made free from sin. He became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22, being now made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And you see then that uh, when the Lord forgives us, he also gives us freedom, freedom from sin. It tells us in First John chapter three. First John chapter three, verse four. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. Sin is not just something we think about in the head. And then I have a definition of sin. You say, that's you. He has another definition of sin. I will say, that's him. And she has another definition of sin. You say, that's her. As for me, I don't count this one to be sin. 
As for me, I don't count this one to be an offense. No, if we keep to the Bible, there's only one definition. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. When God gives a command, that's the law. When we transgress that commandment, we transgress that law, we break that commandment, that's a sin. Because it says there, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, not to add unto our sins. And you know there are people that feel that, you know, as now they have come to Christ. It's like even the sins they were not committing when they were in the world. They now bring in new sins as if the forgiveness of God introduces them to a new kind of error, a new kind of sin, a new kind of evil that they were not even doing before. But he was manifested not to add sin to our lives, but to take our sins away. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abides in him, sin is not. Don't judge other people, just judge yourself. If you abide in Christ, you will not sin. You need all the time to watch over yourself. You don't have any time, any extra time to watch over other people. So, to look at other people. They are talking about him. Ah, we are not talking about him. We are talking about you. They are talking about her. We are not talking about her. We are talking about you. It tells us here very clearly that we know that he was manifested to take away our sins. That's you. And that in him is no sin. And whosoever abides in him, sin is not. I look at my life. You look at your life. The evidence that I am abiding in Christ is that I do not continue in sin. Or sin, transgression of the law of God. The evidence that you, you are abiding in Christ is that you do not continue in sin. Whosoever abideth in him, sineth not. There is no modern salvation. There is no ancient salvation. Salvation is salvation. Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. The salvation of, God, of years gone by is the same salvation of today. Because the Jesus of years gone by is the same Jesus of today. Jesus Christ has the power to forgive. And he has the power to quicken whom he will. He has the power to renew. And he has the power to give you the victory over your sin and over the flesh and over the devil. Jesus Christ of yesterday is the Jesus of today, is the Jesus of, t- of tomorrow. He is ever the same. His salvation is ever the same. Don't t- let anybody tell you, aha, uh-huh. the salvation of many years ago, they were free from sin. The salvation of today... They cannot be free from sin. That's error. That's a lie. That's deception of the devil. Because Jesus remains the same today. Whosoever abides in him will be like whosoever in years gone by remained in him. And whosoever abides in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. He that committeth sin is of the devil. And you find a person saying, my sins are forgiven. And then they will say, although I know that I'm still sinning every day, and I don't ever hope to be free from sin, because I don't think in this world I can ever be free from sin. I don't want to deceive myself. Well, you don't want to deceive yourself. You are void, devoid of the grace of God. Because if you have the grace of God, that grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly laws, to live soberly, righteously, godly, unblameably in this present world. 
You don't want to deceive yourself that you don't have the grace of God. That's right. You don't have the grace of God yet. You don't have the salvation of God yet. When we have the salvation of God, He that abides in Him, having the salvation of God, He does not commit sin. But it, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. And for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Whosoever, any time, any era, any period, any century, whether when deeper life just started, or when deeper life has been there for some years, because there are some people that tell us, ah, the salvation of 1970 something. Oh, that salvation at that time, no adultery, no fornication, no sin, the people, uh, that's the kind of salvation they had at this time. But you know, times have changed. No, but the Bible has not changed. But heaven has not changed. But Jesus has not changed. But the Holy Ghost has not changed. But the power, the efficacy in the blood of the Lamb has not changed. And the requirement of getting to heaven has not changed. And so they say, but you know, things have changed. That the salvation of today, you get the salvation of today, and you still be committing sin. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. Any time, any day, any period, any era, any century, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For the seed of God remains in him. And he cannot sin, he will not sin, because he is born of God. Chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Whosoever. Whosoever, that's the evidence we are born of God, will not go back into a vomit, will not go back into the mire, will not go back into the pollution, will not go back into the evil things we were doing before. We know, here John said, thank God there is no ignorance among the people that are truly born again. Thank God uh, there is no desire to go back into evil among the people that are truly genuinely born again. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Keepeth himself. How does he do that? You will not deliberately put yourself in the way of temptation. You will not deliberately invite sin partners to come and lure you, deceive you, entice you back into sin. We know that you whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one touches him not. From the word of God we learn that there is a privilege of living free from sin. When we are born again, if, the, if you have not got the privilege yet and you have not found the grace of God in your life to live free from sin, it's an evidence you have not been truly born again, genuinely born again. Go back to Calvary. Go back to the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus is still efficacious today. And the blood of Jesus is still cleansing. And the blood of Jesus will wash and cleanse you from sin. Christ has made adequate provision for our forgiveness as well as for our freedom from all sins. Well then, by the power of His blood, and by the power of His word, and by the provision of His grace, and by the protection as our shepherd, and by prevention as the Heavenly Father, we are kept free from sin, kept in righteousness, justification, holiness, purity of life. I come to point number three. Christ's precept of forgiveness for saved souls. You see, Christian, uh, the Christians, that is, the people that know the Lord, the people who are born again, it's not only that we receive forgiveness from the Lord, what we receive from the Lord, we give to others. He's giving us love, we are received, we give that love to others. 
is giving us forgiveness, we give that forgiveness to others. Christian love and Christian forgiveness are taught and commanded and demanded by Christ. A true believer, that is, having Christ living in him as a spirit of love. A true child of God will have a spirit of forgiveness in his heart towards his fellow man. Within your home, you have a spirit of love and forgiveness towards your husband, towards your wife, towards your children, towards your parents, towards your neighbors, towards your friends, towards members of the church, and towards those who are not members of the church. A real Christian, a born again child of God, will not say, well, thank God the Lord has forgiven me, but that's my privilege, but I cannot forgive other people. He has overlooked all my past sins, but I, can overlo- I cannot overlook all the past sins of other people. That, that, that's just difficult. It's impossible for me. It's impossible for me. I enjoy forgiveness, but I cannot give it to others to enjoy. Nothing like that. When you have received the forgiveness of the Lord, then you also distribute and you give and you share that forgiveness with others. Actually, an old Spanish proverb says... To return evil for good is devilish. To return good for good is human. And then to return good for evil is godlike. That is, somebody has done good to you. And you return evil to them. Even these uh, Spanish people said in their proverb, that's devilish. That's of the devil. People do good to you. They show love to you. And they give their very lives to be a blessing to you. And you do evil to them in exchange for the good they are doing to you. That's devilish. But then they said, to return good for good. That's human. You do good to them. And they do good back to you. That's human. That's human nature. That's no salvation. It is not a proof of salvation when you greet those who greet you. Because the publicans do the same. When you smile at the people that smile at you, the publicans do the same. When you, when you give money to the people that give you money, the publicans do the same. When you are friendly, or the people that are friendly to you, the publicans do the same. When you return good for good, that's just human. That doesn't show that you are born again. But when you return good for evil, that's godlike. That's like God. That people have done evil to you and you are able to forgive them and love them and you are able to be a blessing to them. That is the godly nature right there being manifested in your life. Luke chapter 17. Christ's precept of forgiveness for saved souls. In Luke chapter 17 verse 3 and verse 4. Take it to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day again, uh, turn to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. That's the precept of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I hope you read with understanding. If thy brother trespass against thee. The sins you are to forgive are the sins that are against you. If somebody has offended another person, you cannot go to the person and say, I see you have offended brother A, sister B. Okay, I forgive you. What right have you? To forgive an offense that is not committed against you. And it's the same thing. Uh, let's say, for example, you are on the street. And uh, you've done, you've committed a crime. And, you know, the law enforcement agent there uh, says, see what you have done. This is a crime. And then instead of the law enforcement agent uh, arresting that individual because he has sinned against the law of the country. And he just says, okay... You have done this evil thing, this fraudulent thing, and you have you've been involved in this murder. Look at me. I'm a law enforcement agent, but I'm a Christian. I forgive you. Go your way. You cannot do that. It's not an offense against you. You're an officer. And you're doing your duty. And you're sinned against another. 
you cannot forgive sins that are not committed against you. And so, here it says, If thy brother trespass against thee, and then you rebuke him, and if you repent, forgive him. The, repent, the forgiveness we are talking about is a scriptural forgiveness. There is sentimental forgiveness. There is scriptural forgiveness. The sentimental forgiveness is not right. Number one, it's deficient. To be deficient means it is lacking in something necessary. The fellow has no change of heart. The fellow has no remorse for his sin. The fellow is not feeling sorry that he even hurt anybody. He wants to keep on doing evil. That kind of forgiveness is sentimental. It's like David calling Absalom and saying, Absalom, you know what? I see that you kill your brother Amnon. I know you don't even feel sorry about it. But I'm your father. Okay, I forgive you. Leave wherever you want. Ah, David, that's dangerous. The forgiveness that David gives Absalom without any evidence of repentance is deficient and it's dangerous. Number two, it's deceptive. Because you see, when you hand over, when you hand out forgiveness like that, forgive, I forgive, I forgive. Yeah, you're not looking at the words of Jesus. What did Jesus say? If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Don't say, I'm not going to talk. I don't want to talk about any offense. I just want to talk about love. Rebuke him. That's what Jesus said. If he repent, that's what Jesus said. Forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you again saying, I'm sorry. I don't, want, I don't know what came on me. I repent. Forgive him. So, it must not be sentimental forgiveness, which, number one, is deficient. Number two, is deceptive. Number three, is degenerative. That's a medical word. It means it makes somebody get worse, morally. When somebody, you know, somebody beats up his wife, and then will say, what did I hear? You beat your wife, okay, we forgive you. Go on in the work of God you are doing. And then another time, he starves his uh, child, and he almost wants to kill that child. Come here. We hear about you again, that this is what you are doing. And it's okay, I forgive. Now, it's going to make that person, because that fellow knows, you know, they are now teaching forgiveness in the church. They have told my wife to forgive, my children to forgive, everybody to forgive. Whatever I do, they have given us this blank check. Forgive, forgive. It's degenerative. It's going to make people live worse. And uh, you know, for example, an husband has uh, backslidden and has been sleeping with women everywhere. Sleeping with harlots and sleeping with HIV aid carriers and then comes back home and then says, uh, my wife, how are you? I'm fine. What did you hear in the church today? We heard about forgiveness. All right. Uh, I returned home, go and cook for me. And... Uh, have you come back? Like, well, I've come back. Didn't they tell you forgive us? Okay, then in the evening, come. Why are you sleeping in another place? Come over here. Are we not going to sleep together? Ah, I don't know where you have been. Because all those women you have been sleeping with, and you are now HIV AIDS a carrier, go and do tests. I forgive you, but don't kill me. You see, the forgiveness we are talking about is Bible-based scriptural forgiveness. And then, number four, that sentimental forgiveness makes people delinquent. Delinquent. That means it will make them to commit more crimes. It doesn't matter what you do. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Ah, the scriptural forgiveness is a reasonable Bible-based forgiveness. That kind of forgiveness is destructive of morals. Deficient, deceptive, degenerative, delinquent, destructive. Number six, it distorts our view and understanding of God. Where there is this kind of sentimental, fleshly, floppy forgiveness that is not well understood, it distorts our understanding of God. 
the people will think that is how God is. That whether there is repentance or not, will get to heaven. And then, number seven, that kind of sentimental forgiveness damns the soul eventually and eternally. It is the reason why when you come to the Lord, you tell the Lord you repent of your sins. You turn away from your sin. And then as we relate to one another, if you offend me, I call you. My brother, how could you have done? This is not right. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. This cannot be right. We are Christians. We are a child of God. I am a child of God. And we are following the principle of the good rule. This one you have done hurts. Don't do that again. Oh, I'm sorry, pastor. I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry, sister. Uh, I, I was careless. I won't do that again. Okay, go about your business. I forgive you. That's forgiveness. That's scriptural. The forgiveness that is scriptural, number one, it has repentance in it. Repentance. Number two, restitution. You'll give an apology. Or you will Give back the things were stolen. Number three, redemption. It gets you redeemed. It gets you out of the bondage, out of the cage. Number four, reconciliation. When there is real forgiveness, there is reconciliation. And you are not behaving and just dealing with one another. See, let me be very careful now. I don't know what you will still bring out of the pocket. Let me be very careful now. I don't know the way he's still going to react to me. Whether it's forgiveness, there's reconciliation. Number five, there is righteousness. We do not do the things we used to do when there is real forgiveness. I forgive you, you forgive me. He forgives us, she forgives him. That forgiveness comes along with righteousness. Number six, with responsibility. I pick up my responsibility again. This is my duty towards you. And when, I, when you have not forgiven me, I was irresponsible. I wasn't doing what I ought to do. But now, you are forgiving me. And I am so grateful. And that brings me to responsibility. Number seven, reciprocity. That reciprocity means that now, as I have got the forgiveness of God, I forgive other people too. That's what Jesus said. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? There are seven times. Jesus says unto him, I say not unto thee, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which will take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. And but the same servant went out, and he found one of his fellow servants which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but he went and cast him into the prison, till he should pay the debt. So, when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told, of, and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord... After he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgive thee all that death, because thou desertest me, shouldest thou not also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee, reciprocity. The Lord has forgiven you. And because the Lord has forgiven you, you go ahead and forgive other people too. And then he said in verse 34, and his Lord was wrath, and delivered him to the tormentors, 
and till he shall pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. After you have enjoyed the forgiveness of the Lord, you have experienced the forgiveness of the Lord, the Lord wants you, like he has forgiven you, to forgive other people too. Scriptural forgiveness coming along with repentance and restitution and redemption and reconciliation, righteousness, responsibility, reciprocity. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another. Have you experienced the love of God and the kindness of God and the goodness of God and the forgiveness of God? Now be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. I pray the Lord will give us the grace to receive forgiveness from Him and then to give that forgiveness to other people. The Lord will not accept any excuse for resentment, any excuse for ill will, any excuse for unforgiveness, any excuse for bitterness or retaliation or bearing grudges, no matter what the provocation may be, regardless of what people have done. We must forgive those who have trespassed against us if we want to keep our own forgiveness and if we desire eternal fellowship with God in heaven. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord before we go today. Forgiveness is available from God and uh, the grace of God is available to set us free from our sins. Remember, if we die in sin, there's no hope of eternal life or being in fellowship eternally with the Lord. It is when the Lord has Forgiving us, giving us His grace, giving us His salvation. Our names are reaching the book of life in heaven. It is then we have the hope of heaven. And when we have the grace in our heart to be free from bitterness and retaliation and revenge, and then we are living the life that shows the love of God is in us. Let's close our eyes and really pray. Let's pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I've heard your word. I don't want to come to church in vain. I don't want to serve you in vain. I don't want to read the Bible in vain. I don't want to follow you in vain. I want to get to heaven eventually. And to get to heaven, you need to be free from your sin. The Lord will forgive you today. But then as He forgives you, He tells you, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Don't play with salvation. Don't joke with salvation. Don't joke with eternal life. And then as we relate with one another, interact with one another, we share the love of God with others. We share the grace of God with others. The forgiveness of God we share with others. The love of God we share with others. That as the Lord has forgiven us, we distribute that love. We share that love. We give that love to the people that offend us too. Don't let your life be taken over by bitterness. And by determination to revenge, determination to oppress the people that oppressed you before, determination to make the people pay by all means. You will pay for it. You did that against me, you'll pay for it. You don't have that heart, you don't have that mind. Salvation sets us free. Free from our own sins and free from wanting to retaliate and revenge and our bitterness and oppression, dealing with other people with oppression. Take care of your relationship with the Lord. Receive forgiveness from the Lord. Conditional forgiveness. If we confess and forsake our sins, He will give us mercy. 
It will give us forgiveness. And it will give us cleansing. It will change our lives. The blood of Jesus will wash us whiter than snow. I've got to show us in your heart before you go. And then the grace of God to live free from sin. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It will give you the grace to go and sin no more. And then the grace to love other people, fellowship with other people, forgive other people. And it's not sentimental forgiveness that is deceptive and destructive and damnable. But scriptural, scriptural, scriptural forgiveness goes along with repentance, restitution, with reconciliation, with righteousness, with responsibility, with reciprocity. Let the grace of the Lord touch your heart more before you go back home.